welcome to the Whatnots Review Show number 272. Palindrome, is that right? Is it 272 or 252? I don't know. Numbers are all strange. It's 272. I know it's palindromatic, which is fun. I always like those ones. Uh, my name is Kyle Springer. I am joined by Melissa Wilkinson. Melissa, how has your weekend been? It's the last weekend in September. We're about to enter spooky season. It is. I, it's been spooky season. I already watched my first Tim Burton movie of the season. So that's when there it starts. Go. <laughs> Good stuff. We we had something to kind of mark the start of the spooky season. Uh, my partner and I yesterday went to the Bone Museum. We ah! got to see a bunch of skeletons. Yeah. Yes. Skeletons of all sorts of animals. There were even people. There were there were skulls and, and like full human skeletons. There were uh, there was a, like a giant humpback whale that was like hanging from the ceiling. Cool. Um, got to see lions. We got to see little, little like wombats and dick dicks and all sorts of stuff. And yeah, crazy. <laughs> so I, we had a good time. I'm happy you went. When I went to visit you in Oklahoma City and I was researching local attractions, you guys do have a thriving museum scene. I believe you also have the Museum of the Banjo and the Museum of the Pigeon. That one I haven't heard of, I don't think. Um, But yes, Banjo, I think, is a real thing. I know we have some history stuff. We have like a a cowboy museum. We have like a Wild West museum. Uh, so, yeah, we have a, a, a good little small, small community of uh, of museums. This one was like a family owned and operated uh, oh. one. They have like the original skull that this guy like won a trophy for back in like elementary school for like just his, his interest skull. in. Yeah, just his like interest in like archaeology and what's the the study of bones? It's like osteology, osteology or something like that. Yeah, um, and he was just like super big into that, and so I guess won some science archaeology thing, and that started it all. And then he was like, "This belongs in a museum." <laughs> Are there any of the family's bones in the museum? Like when d- d- uncle died, is he like, put me there? So see no. me every day at work. <laughs> I'm never leaving this museum. I'm haunting its halls. <laughs> um, no, I don't think a- any of the actual family members uh, are in there. So that'd be interesting. I-, I don't know if the guy that founded it is still alive. I'm kind of assuming he is, but I don't know. Um, that could be an interesting thing. I I would also kind of like that's not too far fetched to be like, yeah, when I die, my bones go in my right. museum front and center. <laughs> Here we go. Where where else would I put myself? Yeah. Yeah. They had uh like like they said that most of the bones in the museum were right, 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 uh, and then in their gift shop, they even sold shirts that said, yes, they're real. Um, <laughs> like right on the <laughs> right, right on the chest. Um, and they had a few that were not real. Re- 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 they were um, I was going to say reproductions, but that's not the right yeah. word. They're replicas. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, they had uh, all sorts of different animals uh, from all sorts of different countries. But then, like, the first thing that you got to see before you even, uh, like, went in the museum was, like, this is how we clean off the b- 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 bones. It's a bunch of flesh-eating beetles. And they have, like, cool. a window where you can see them, like, chomping on a cat skull or a, a fox skull or something like that. So it was just like, wow, wow this is weird. Get this it, boys. Cool. Yeah. Nom, 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 nom. So that's what we did this weekend. Good start to the, the spooky season here. Uh, but I guess here on the podcast we kind of got an early start to spooky season because we are continuing our coverage of mike mignola's hell boy um here on the show this week we are reading volumes four through six 
uh last month the end of the month we covered the first three volumes so if you guys want to go back and check that out uh you guys can go do so just a handful of episodes back but yeah continuing our coverage of mike Mignola's hell boy because if you guys did not know this is the what nots review show where each week we have a different story to talk about it could be a comic a movie an anime a manga a tv show all sorts of stuff we read it, we watch it, we come back here, and we talk about it. Melissa, let's dive in. Mike Mignola's Hell Boy, volumes four through six. Let me, let me um, pull up Comixology here so I can even say what the titles of these volumes yeah. were. We have volume four, The Right Hand of Doom, volume five, Conqueror Worm, and volume six, Strange Places. Mm -hmm. So... There you go. Melissa, what do you think? We're a little bit deeper into how well yes. we are both kind of experiencing this for the first time. We've seen the movies, but that's about it. What did you think? I really enjoyed these volumes. There's a good variety of stories and settings here. I think mm -hmm. I, I really like the different formats that we get. We get these longer stories that are maybe like one whole volume. But there's a lot of just one issue, two issue, six pages. Like he, he's a character who works in all of these different lengths and formats. And mm -hmm. I really like that. Uh, that You get the longer things with all of the supporting characters in there. You get a good subplot for Roger the homunculus and Lobster Johnson. But you just get like 10 pages of, of him doing something weird somewhere else. Yeah, this drinking with some skeletons so <laughs> um yeah i i enjoyed these a lot i think uh volume five in particular really spoke to me conquer mm -hmm. worm because uh, that did kind of get back to the like the main plot or, or mm -hmm. um not a like here's a one-off short story that you could potentially read by itself um and and stuff like that and i i, I like the the like main story what after those first three volumes and we were kind of thrust into I, I don't know exactly what's happening with Rasputin and all of that stuff and and end times and I, I felt more comfortable in this space by this volume mm. and so volume five was like ah I feel right at home here with this um and then I thought Volume six was also particularly interesting because it goes to these uh, what what were like two issue short stories, um, but they also both happen to be like immediately what happens next after mm -hmm. volume five. So you can kind of read these four issues as like, here's just what happens next in the story or yeah, they were these like short stories that can be read by themselves and they, they they're just kind of interesting on their own yeah um, yeah you you theoretically could pick up hellboy at any time and get enough of what's going on but there there is a continuity and a consistency there and there's this sort of looming threat in every story in which he appears that Hellboy yeah. in Africa short story was my favorite one we've read so far. For sure. For sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I really enjoyed diving more into this. We do kind of get an origin of his right hand. Uh, oddly enough, not in the volume entitled The Right Hand of Doom. Um, <laughs> it does not come until volume six. But like, I, I think that is of these three volumes it is yes it's the next step in the story but it is also like okay we've had a little bit of hell boy it's kind of a success what is kind of the next step that we need to uncover and in one of these volumes mignola had a little excerpt of him reflecting on these stories of of just saying like i've i've spent years now kind of thinking about the world that hellboy lives in i have a bunch of secrets about this world mm -hmm. that i haven't told yet and that's always the challenge of like when do i start to tell you some of these secrets here and yeah. I, I 
don't want to say this is the first instance of him doing that and revealing a a secret um but this is one of i guess one of the first bigger ones besides the fact that hellboy has horns that a lot of <laughs> people did not know at the start um mm -hmm. but but yeah it's like hey he is something about his right hand here let's uncover that story you also catch up to the point in time where Guillermo del Toro is making the first Hellboy movie. And that's yeah. an impetus to Mike Mignola writing one of these stories is that uh, an element he had been working with was going to appear in the movie. And he's like, well, if it's making it to the movie, I this is my time to tell you a little bit more about it in the comics. If you're yeah. seeing it on screen, I do want to give you more context. So here it is. Yeah. And that was interesting to me, too, because I think Del Toro did the intro for volume five, I, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, and yeah, that like I so again, I haven't read any Hellboy comics except for what we've done here on the podcast. Uh, so I don't know like what spinoffs he had already started and by just the hell boy comics proper it's like man, he he's only on volume five of of this and del toro is already making the the movie is that right does that timeline because i know that um the version we're reading of these on comicsology unlimited is the second edition of mm. these volumes of a lot, a lot a lot of a lot of these volumes so i'm even wondering if this intro is written later like there are more comics available out there and he wasn't really well i don't know because he was it is the like you just said it is the like well he's making it in the movies so i need to get these out in the comics before the movie comes out. It's just wild to me to think that they went ahead and made this movie so early on in mm. Hellboy's career in terms of like issue number. And then to think like, man, he had that much of an impact in like only three or four volumes. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. He's an impactful character. I think that is yeah. one of the the joys of him is that. You you can get it the essence of Hellboy so quickly, and he's immediately so compelling. Hellboy, yeah. his name, his appearance alone is so intriguing. You got to know more about this boy. Like, I just felt there was already like twenty volumes out before they even thought about making a movie. And again, I, I don't know what spinoffs there had been if they had if if they'd started to write all the BPRD comics or the Abe Sapien spinoffs or the, the Lobster Johnson stuff. Um, I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. But yeah, you, you even just still like, man, volume five. And he's like, oh, shit, the movie's about to be out. Here we go. Let me <laughs> put this here. So that's fun. This is good. I, I enjoyed these a lot. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you want to do a a kind of synopsy thing here to catch <laughs> us up for what we're kind of doing? I, Is that possible? I don't I don't I think you have a better grasp on the larger mythology than I do. To be honest, I don't feel like I do. I <laughs> it, it's like he's got the big hand. He's supposed to bring about an apocalypse like old Nazis and Rasputin and the witch goddess Hecate want him to do this. And he's like, no, I got my own life. I'm doing my own stuff. I didn't ask you get out of here. Yeah. And they, um, in the second volume, there's, uh, again, an old Nazi scientist, <laughs> much like Indiana Jones. It's always Nazis. We hate these guys. They was trying to, they like sent a they sent a dead guy into space and then the dead guy comes back and he's got some sort of an alien on him. Not like Venom, but like a big the titular conqueror worm and the worm's going to come and like burn up all of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the, the first volume, the right hand of Dome, we get a couple short stories uh, including pancakes, the nature of the beast and King oh. Void. Um, 
these are yeah j j just kind of uh things that are happening earlier on in Hellboy's career uh just kind of a look back at like what were some of the 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 earlier adventures he had when he was a little bit younger or like brand new to all of this um and then uh in volume five the conqueror worm yeah we go back to uh this like nazi castle uh and it is this kind of pulp adventure story in fact the uh like de 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 dedication to the book here says for doc savage the shadow the spider g8 and the men who read out them and for the original 11 and a half inch gi joe yeah. Um, and it like I, like I just thought that was so cool because it is. Yeah, there's this mm. pu this pulp story uh, where they go back to this castle. And yeah, there's this guy who's been sent out to to space to be a vessel for these like alien gods uh, that are out there. Uh, and they are finally returning to Earth. And they have, as the book name implies, this conqueror worm that is set to destroy all of humanity and the world. And then remake everything they're supposed to be like all right that didn't work let's wipe everything out act yeah. two scene two here we go right mm. um and then uh in volume six right I, I guess i should say because of the mess of volume five help with quits he's like that's it i've seen enough mm -hmm. weird things i'm gonna go off and do something else to which he then goes and finds more weird things uh, namely in Africa. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so the the weird just chases him wherever he goes. Um, and yeah, and it's in volume six that we start to get to the like origin of the world, the origin of his right hands, all of that craziness. Um, so there is some some interesting things happening here in these three volumes. But yeah, I'd say that's a good synopsis of what's happening uh, in mm -hmm. these ones here uh do you have any other kind of final thoughts that you want to add to this spoiler furry stuff before we go into that housekeeping no let's go ahead cool 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 so yeah we will go into housekeeping for a sec and then uh when we get back we'll start diving into these books a little bit more in depth we will be right back here at The Whatnots, we make multiple different shows, and a lot of hard work goes into making them, so we would love it if you check them all out. If you enjoy our shows, patreon.com slash the whatnots is the best place to show your support. For just a dollar a month, you can get early access to episodes, and at our $3 tier, a Patreon-exclusive podcast, The Pilots Club. You can even get a shout out and thank you on most of our shows at the $5 tier. And if you're one of our patrons already, Thank you so much. It means the world to us. You can find out more information on our website, thewhatnots.com, as well as your favorite podcasting platform of choice. When you type in The Whatnots, all of our shows will pop up right there. Just don't forget to give us a nice rating and review if you like the shows. You can also find us on YouTube and Twitch for video versions of the shows, trailer reactions, and live streams. And lastly, we have merch. If you want to grab yourself a shirt or a hoodie or a mug or something else, head over to thewhatnots.com slash store to pick up some merch today. All right, we are back once again. A big shout out to our Patreon supporters. Thank you. We Thank you. It. We love you a lot. It means a ton. Um, over on the Pilots Club this past month, we got to talk about winning time, the rise of the Lakers dynasty. Uh, which was a very, very interesting sh show stylistically. But for this next month, for October, Melissa, we are diving into more Mike Mignola. What are we yes. talking about this next month? We are talking about the pilot to a would-be animated TV series called The Amazing Screw on Head, based on another Mignola comic and animated very much in his style. Uh, the Amazing Screw on Head is an android with a, a head like his he can be have his head screwed into different bodies so we can be all sorts of different people infiltrate all sorts of secret clandestine operations sounds great 
Uh, and interestingly enough, the amazing screw on head got a mention in one of the forwards to or the, the intros to one of these volumes. Uh, I was like, oh, hey, I'm about to watch that. <laughs> so that was good. That was fun. Uh, over on the review show uh, this past week, we got to talk about Sideways, a, a movie from 2005 uh starring paul G- giamatti and god i always mess up his name thomas, thomas hayden, hayden Ch- church. church right okay cool nailed yes. it. awesome um he, he's yeah. one of my favorite trivia team names i frequently name myself take me to thomas hayden church <laughs> there you go <laughs> um and it is a it, it's a really fascinating may i may i be both about wine and metaphors for life and all that stuff but also a comedy it it's it's it, it also oddly feels almost like a predecessor to the hangover in a weird way um but uh, yeah it just it, an interesting <laughs> maybe none the less we had a great yeah. time we watched that it's, for uh <laughs> shame timber <laughs> so yeah it's the hangover for wine nerds who are trying to publish a novel <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so go go check that one out. We had a blast talking about that uh, over on the captain's log. Not only did we get to talk about our thoughts to a haunting in Venice, but Melissa, you are d- d- diving headfirst into a fantasy movie league. Apparently, you've got all sorts of spreadsheets. You're the the, yes. the red string meme <laughs> back here trying to figure it all out. Um, uh, yeah. We and my time. my team name, my fantasy movie team name is Paul G.M. Hottie. Uh, he's, he's one of the front runners for best lead actor this year. <laughs> he's Good my pick. stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, so we had a blast on that. I also got to talk about the Mountain Dew uh, mystery flavor, Mountain Dew Voodoo 2023, mm. uh, and how disappointed I am in that flavor. So go go check out the Captain's Log from this past week. We had a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, that is about it for housekeeping right now. So let's get back to Hellboy. Okay, we are officially in spoiler territory for these three volumes here, and I think we have to start with the first short story we read in volume uh, four here, Pancakes. Mm -hmm. I thought this was hilarious. This was great. I loved this. Just little baby Hellboy. They feed him pancakes, and then all of these like demons and arcane forces are watching him, and they're like, no. We've lost him now. He belongs to humanity. He has tasted the pancakes. Great. It's just this little two page short story. And he he it's breakfast time and he wants noodles. He wants like hot noodles Um, or. Yeah, he says he wants hot noodles. And then they're like, no, pancakes. And then he's like, I don't want pancakes. Pancakes are stupid. And they're like, you haven't had them. Like, just try right. them. <laughs> and You're then a baby. He eats them. A baby from yeah. hell. He, he eats them and he loves them. And then smash cut to just screams in hell and just no! Gnashing of teeth, weeping, like rending of garments. And they're just like, we've officially lost him <laughs> to pancakes. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it, it's it's wild because on that very next page is where Minyala has his like here's my thoughts about all of the, 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 these short stories, and he didn't really want to do that story. Like <laughs> they were like, do a story about baby Hellboy, and he was like, eh, I don't know, that's not gonna go over well. He's like, I'll I'll do one about him eating pancakes. Hikes, and it's just going to be this little, you know, no one will care. care. Uh, and uh, I, I I think it is my favorite Hellboy story so far. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Pancakes are great. Amazing. I wish it came back in the many stories that are about how these dark magic forces of the universe are counting on Hellboy to bring about destruction. And he doesn't want to. I wish there was some little demon who's like, boss, we saw him eat the pancakes. We know he's not going to do it. Like the pancakes were our forewarning. 
<laughs> he'll never be on our side again. We ought to come up with better, more devilish pancakes to feed him. <laughs> okay, but what if they had syrup traps? We'll call them waffles. Syrup traps. <laughs> Thanks, It'll Mitch be a Hedberg. cage for syrup. Uh, yeah. Syrup will never again see the light of day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It'll be hell for syrup. Waffles. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, like, I... I like Minyola does such a great job. We, we we talked about this last time that he does such a great job of weaving in all this folklore and mythology and and stuff that it just kind of feels cohesive and it it feels like this one one thing that all fits right. But there's there's often also this like grandiose nature. Mm to it all especially in a comic dealing with fate and defying fate mm -hmm. and like this is what you were meant for you're meant to bring about this destruction and destroy all of the stuff right it, it 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 feels interesting when you can find magic or find something powerful in something yeah. mundane right where it's just like pancakes dude do pancakes really hold that much sway yeah. over the magical universe here in Hellboy? <laughs> like, I, I do want this to c c come back in some, like, yes. small... Yes, I want more of this. Way, more pancakes. <laughs> more pancakes, please. Yeah, show <laughs> us more forces of positive magic out there in the world. This is a story yeah. that pulls from so many aspects of folklore and culture and literature and urban legends and all of that bring in somebody who's could be a force for good like hellboy teams up with paul bunyan probably eats like a hundred pancakes every day like paul bunyan's got to be a good guy yeah yeah something else that uh i just came on the like for horse for good thing we haven't re really been introduced to hellboy's love for cats yet yes. that hasn't really come up and that's always this, been a notable thing it's one of the things i remember from the movies right this is something i was just that. thinking about that now that we have approximately caught up to when guillermo del toro was making the movie there's stuff in that movie that i thought must have been from the comics but it isn't here yet the love for cats uh, he loves television and candy. I remember that Chiron when Hellboy is first introduced in that movie and his romance with Liz Sherman. We've met Liz. The two are, are teammates. Yeah. They're friends. But if I had just been reading the comic, I'm like, does he end up with Dr. Corrigan, like the folklore expert expert? Like we see her much right. more often. Yeah. Um yeah, there's absolutely some 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 interesting stuff to be like, OK, now how will this new media mm -hmm. start influencing uh, the comics? Because every once in a while you see that happen, like in Marvel comics and, and stuff like that. A, a new movie comes out, they introduce a, a new character that hasn't been in the MCU yet. Mm. And then in the comics, they just ever so slightly start drawing the character to look a little bit more like the actor and um, but yeah th yeah th th that'll be interesting to see but it it's it it was not only just kind of a comedic moment to see him like eat these pancakes and everyone's just like no we've lost him um but it, just in in juxtaposition to all this like biblical revelations and and like hp lovecraft like ever impending doom and alien space gods and and stuff that you just can't under it just like pancakes the power of breakfast yeah the, the, yes. the power of a good meal like there there has to be like simpler magics out there that yes. can can influence or sway an outcome in ways that no one predicted or even thought of because right. it's so simple and so mundane. I I, I, right. I think that that's an interesting that 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 almost feels more like something Neil Gaiman would do, right? Like the, sure, the, an, an, an interesting simpler side to ma 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 magic. But I would like to see see that explored in yeah, like Hellboy. He yeah. finds a penny, he picks it up. All that day, he has good luck. Nobody, yeah. 
He yeah. defeats a demon because he's like, oh, I picked up a penny this morning. Look, here it is. And the demon's like, no, the penny. Yeah, right. Uh, speaking of at this bone museum, we uh, did one of those p- p- penny. Yeah. Press things. Uh, so we have a like, commemorative uh, piece of copper uh, n- n- now that has a giraffe o- o- on it. And then it says the, the cool. bone museum, which there was a, a big skeleton of a giraffe oh. uh, there. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Perfect Absolutely. creature to put on a pressed penny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The like elongated yes! thing here. Um, fun fact: a g- giraffe has the same amount of bones in their neck as humans do in our neck. They're just real long. They're just long. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh my Indeed. gosh. Anyways, um, yeah. So I, I liked that that uh, pancakes short story quite a bit. Um, the only other thing that I kind of wanted to say about these other two short stories, The Nature of the Beast and King Void, um, was that th- these two almost felt like parables. Like they felt like cautionary mm. tales um, of like, this is what happens when you get greedy. Right. Especially mm-hmm. in that, that King Vo- Void um, one. I, I, I think that's that's the one. Or it's, what's the, or no, it's the. It's this second one here, then, not the king. I know I would remember these a lot better if I was reading them in physical copies where I could. Because, like, you swipe past the title page, the cover, the title page, the table of contents, you're in the story, and you can't easily flip back to be like, what's the name of this volume again? What's the name of this story again? What did Mike Mignola say in the introduction? Like, it's just a linear, like, path forward when I read something on comicsology. I know I can go back, but it's like swipe, 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 swipe. Tap if I had these, scroll. If I, I had mean, these on paper, on that house, that's how you do it on your phone. I read mine on, yeah. on a tablet so that my eyes don't die. Uh, if I had these on paper, these tangible things that I could flip through much more easily at my leisure and, like, see the spine and see the name of it. I, I, I do kind of want to own these. I bet a bunch of Hellboys would look cool on a shelf. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Nature of the Beast is the one where we learn about his blood, like. Uh, ah. D- like giving. I, I was going to say g- 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 giving birth. That's not the right word. But uh, the, the flower that grows yeah. from his blood, um, which was going to be a question of mine on the podcast but it then gets answered la- later on in one of the other v- volumes because in that last panel uh how boy just won this uh fight with like a weird like uh, alligator monster thing uh and walks away he's bloody and his blood is dripping on the ground uh and then the last panel is this flower and i, I was gonna be like is that just like a like a period on the end of a statement, like is it supposed to be metaphorical, like the flower's not really there, but like he has a new outlook on life or something like that, uh, or or like is a flower actually growing from his blood? And then later on, it turns out that someone saw him do that fight and they like he saw the flower pop up. So it. It mm-hmm. answers that, but I was I was in bed. What's your interpretation of that? What what, what do you think happened it's, here? It's blah, blah, blah. magic for sure, and it is another example of even if it might have larger, more ominous meanings. At least on the surface, it looks like a better, a, a kinder magic. This what we've been talking about that we would like to see. There's so many dark forces at play that just seeing you spill blood and a flower grows. That's kind of spooky yeah. and mysterious, but also kind of beautiful. Like that seems like a more right. benevolent magical side effect than a lot of what we've seen so far. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then this last uh, short story, Nature of the Beast, where he goes hunting kind of out in the I want to say Arctic, but it's not the Arctic somewhere cold. Um, and there's like the werewolf person out there and this like ghost hunter on a horse here it, it just it felt like this cautionary tale of greed because the guy hired hell boy to like come with him to 
lure this this ghost out to then get him rich and the guy ends up dying and falling on on this uh this like pile of money that he wanted as it like Mm. burned a hole through him in there so it just it felt like these these like cautionary tales these parables that Mm -hmm. like hey you should uh be careful what you wish for that was a fun visual like the gold coin like burning a hole straight through your hand yeah like you you get all the money but you can't pick it up it feels like a twilight zone uh yeah right um we get a few more short stories heads goodbye mr todd uh the harkalak i believe is how you say that one um some interesting stuff in these the uh heads one is the one in japan it feels that almost one like was a lone cool. wolf in, in i really yeah. like that one that one was so eerie where he he's going through this japanese forest and he, me- he comes across this little like shelter this little inn with all these people gathered around sipping tea and then later after he goes to bed and it's night he goes out and like they're just detached heads floating around like they manifested bodies during the day but at night they are these like headless ghost spirit like head full bodyless yeah. ghost spirits yeah that one with was, their was hair like fl- bobbing around that i i feel like i've seen something like that before like that long, seems like that? the image like the image of the floating head i know there's that one um uh, uh, what was the what were the comics we read last year by the Spiral Guy? Oh, uh, d- d- uh, we read one of uh his short stories. Juji I just bought. Yeah, I just bought. Yes, it was a mock. There's a, uh, but we read yes. his sh- there's short a story, story collection. There's a story in Shivers. We read one of his short story collections, Shivers, where it is like detached heads that are like floating around like balloons right yes yeah and i don't know if i've seen it in like a a japanese commercial or in house or something but just purely the floating head bobbing along in there feels specific to to japanese folklore in a way Mm -hmm. that i i i I don't know for sure i don't know if that is maybe there's many cultures that have a a bobbing head (laughs) but something about that pairing made sense to me reading it here on the page also a long long time ago um episode 42 of the whatnots review show here we read the first two volumes of jim zub's wayward volumes one and two and that had a lot of like japanese mythology and folklore in that I, i i don't remember exactly if there was this stuff in there but it felt similar now that i i'm like thinking back on all of that um so interesting stuff in there. Uh, let's see here. What do we got? What do we got? We get this book, uh, the um, the story about the seance, this dude basically kind of be being attached to this spirit thing and it like ballooning up and they have to. That was also cool. It. Yeah. Um, and then what is this? Other one that that one was goodbye, Mister Todd. What is this next one here? The 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 Varkalak. I, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Um, that one was a trippy one where he like falls in in the coffin and it leads to this underground thing and there's all yeah. these ghosts being like, "Stay, we want you here." Yeah. Um, some, some some interesting short sto- stories in all of this for sure. Um. But then part three, we finally get the right hand of doom and box full of evil. Um, yeah, the, the the right hand of D- doom short story is just kind of this idea like it, it's it's the planting of the seed that, hey, mm. there is a bigger story behind this right hand. We know it looks a little bit funky. It, it is giant compared to your other one here. Uh, but it's not the it's not the full story of the, the right hand. It's, it's just mm-hmm. this like there's more to this here. Um, mm-hmm. So 
some interesting stuff there in uh, this first volume. Do you want to move on to Conqueror Worm here for a little bit? Sure. The introduction uh, of the Lobster Worm. Johnson. Yeah, who at, at least for I, us. I think we t- who we talked about briefly in the last episode, and I said. I know enough about comics that I have heard the name Lobster Johnson before, but I can't tell Mm -hmm. you like who he is or what he does. And he is this Captain America esque, but not so explicitly patriotic, like crusader against like enemies. And he's from like World War II. We did a lot of Nazi punching. He's got like a claw emblem on his chest, and that's what he yells: is, "Taste the claw!" And then he punches you. <laughs> and he's he, so it sounds like he also b- 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 will brand like the bad guys oh, yeah. he k- 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 kills or stuff with like a lobster like uh, thing on their f- forehead or something l- l- like that. So it, yeah, it is like. It's almost Captain America, but what if Captain America stayed in the shadows and was this like pulp yes. hero? Yes. Like, and, and he's like so maybe a little more brutal than like. <laughs> yes. Right. He is yeah. brutal. Like he will like decimate like 20 guys without really asking too many questions. Not in that in the same way that he just does what the government tells him to do. And he's this like oblivious operative. But he's like. He's a, a kick ass and ask questions later sort of guy. And then yeah. everybody's dead and he doesn't really get the chance to ask any questions. Like he really does not have a lot of sympathy for people he considers on the enemy's side, which in this case has mostly been and all, all these Nazis and all these war enemies and things like that. Like you can see him being this very effective, very inspiring hero for certain times. But there's something about him that is so direct And so focused and almost like maniacal in I am here. I am here to destroy all of them in that he's kind of scary. (laughs) It's like you don't want to cross Lobster Johnson. He doesn't have the same sort of humanity to him that Hellboy and his friends have. Let me ask you this. Based on what we read here, which is all that we know, is Lobster Johnson real in this book? (laughs) You mean, is he like a a figment? Yeah. <laughs> is, is he a Tyler Durden? Yeah. Yeah. Is is he like a manifestation of one of these aliens trying? Because I read that, that there was like that one alien ah. that was locked up in the bottom that seemed to kind of be helping them by manifesting right. certain people that they knew and and trusted. Right. Um, and I like, is that the case for Lobster Johnson? Is he this manifestation of this mm. alien who's pulling on like who would be a fictional hero in their minds that would inspire them or, yeah. or give them the bravery or courage that they need to complete this task and defeat the the conqueror worm here? I don't know. I, I don't know enough about the rules of what's happening because we see lobster johnson definitely like interact with and have an effect on his surroundings so i don't know Mm -hmm. if he is necessarily a a manifestation because i don't know well what can a manifestation do and not do in in this in this context yeah i mean that's the thing is like how does that manifestation work does does mm. uh Roger the homunculus does he in his mind see lobster Johnson doing it even though it's him doing it mm. like is that is that what's happening here or is it, is, is it just him is it just lobster Johnson this like mysterious like guy who just like, no I, one I, knows if he's real or not and like right. <laughs> I kind of like that idea that he's just he's real but he's utterly it's inexplicable Batman. Like, right. it, you know, I don't know exactly where we are in time uh, in this particular story. But if this guy was around in the 1940s, I know we're past then. And here yeah. he arrives looking like exactly the way he did on like a trading card in 1943. Like he's Absolutely. just sort of mysterious and eternal and like lives exactly to do this. <laughs> the the claw is eternal. Um, yeah, like I I I like that. I like not knowing and feeling like I can interpret that multiple ways. 
Um, cause Hellboy in this just believed he was real. He was like, oh yeah, I, I heard about all his adventures. And then, uh, I forget who it was that was with him there, but he, he was like, no, he's fictional. Like he's a comic book <laughs> character. Like, what are you talking about? Like it's, it's just stories. Um, and then, then yeah, we, we, we get him and he's this, like, we don't know if he's real or not in this story, it's but true. they said he, he, he died in, in this ca- castle. Like this was his last mission, like all that stuff. And he hasn't appeared since, uh, so is he just hanging out in this castle? <laughs> is he just in the right place at the right time? Is he like secretly keeping an, is he another a- agent for the BPRD, but he's mm-hmm. like a black list, like yeah black ops like we will deny all knowledge of him um i don't know but it's 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 neat it's fun who is he yeah Hell he's yeah, fun Lobster Johnson. He, <laughs> right i like that we have another element of pulp history in the story that isn't as supernatural or or criminal you know is salacious just as you're sort of captain america-esque G.I. Yeah. Joe-esque hero getting in the mix here. Uh, I, that story's got a nice cast of characters. We've got uh, more Roger the Homunculus, and I like that whoever the boss of the BPRD is at this time gives Hellboy this device that will kill Roger the Homunculus. Not because they specifically believe this man is a threat, he's going to turn on us, but they're like, he's a homunculus. He's made out of like clay or something. Liz brought him to life with the electricity. Like, <laughs> right. They're like, he's not a a being exactly. We don't really have to be responsible for him. He's more like a tool. So if like, if there is a reason why it basically they're telling Hellboy, if you need to sacrifice him, do it. Absolutely. He is collateral. He's not one of our agents the way you are, for example. And Elboy takes this device, but he's really, really conflicted about it. He likes Roger. Roger has personality. He has feelings. You know, regardless of where he comes from or what he's made out of, he is one of the team. So Elboy doesn't want to do this. Uh, and it really causes a big rift between him and like who is ever in charge at the BPRD. Mm-hmm. And then they end up with Roger like absorbing whatever that alien force is and so it's like trapped inside him and he's like i am a vessel it fills me now now you can you can take me out you can imprison me whatever you need to do i give myself up i give myself up as the vessel to contain or destroy this enemy force yeah um what's interesting to me about that whole thing is yeah that that like detonation device that would kill roger just immediately kind of throws hell blah 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 off. yeah um i i i think he's i mean he has grown up in a human world where he is immediately from day one just introduced to the paranormal the occult the weird the strange the not human right and this seems to be the first time at, at, at least by what we've been shown in these hell boy bo- bo- comics that the BPRD truly is a human government institution, right? It is this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's not human. We don't trust it. And then hell, right. hell, 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 bo- 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 it seems like he hasn't had to think about this all that much. It's mm-hmm. like, but wait, I'm not right. human. Or, or, or like- so... Where it's not like they us? don't it's not that they don't trust Roger, but they look at Roger and they're like, he's disposable. And it's not. And Roger is a different sort of being than than Hellboy or Abe Sapien or, or anybody else who might be on their team. I it's it's sort of vague. And I think that was something I asked in our previous episode is we have Hellboy and Abe Sapien and and Liz, who's like a human with a mutant power and then some like normal human agents on this team together and it seems like there's no question about them all being on a team together is there any history there is there any conflict or friction there you know what how much does the outside world know about the bprd how much does hellboy get to go into the outside world does he go to the movies and everybody's scared of him at the movies like why is there a devil man just here trying to watch 
triple X or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> He's in costume for something, but I, it's not Star Wars. What cosplay I, is I don't this? What so movie's coming yeah. out at midnight tonight? Yeah. Is it, um, he's in a trench coat he must be here to see tombstone <laughs> um yeah no but like it 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 really felt like this kind of eye-opening moment for Hellboy in just like a huh yeah what what is our relationship like where mm -hmm. where do we stay what do you actually think about me like i'm i i don't know uh exactly how quickly hellboy quote unquote ages or anything mm -hmm. like that so how how much kind of turnover does he see in yeah. the bureaucracy of the bprd and like those relationships can change and so he might be under a regime that is not as as trusting or or like hey you are a team we trust you to get the job done but you're also not human so mm. like you go over there and do that stuff that we tell you to do right um mm -hmm. it, yeah like we, it, res I, we respect you but you are tools ultimately yes yeah like if um, we need to sacrifice you yeah. we will we won't go to the lengths we would for a human agent necessarily yeah and i assume that the BPRD comics kind of dives into more of that when it's like, hey, let's mm. let's look at the BPRD and some of their other agents or their uh, other teams out there and what are some of their adventures and the kind of happenings of the BPRD not necessarily focused on Hellboy. Um, I, I think like I as much as I would love it more in these comics, I understand why it's like that. There's almost enough out there to like do your own spinoff book, which they they then mm -hmm. did there. So, um, but again, I have not read all of that, so I don't know how far off I am on all of that. Uh, but yeah, I, I I just thought like, oh, okay, neat moment. It's not j mm. j just fun monster punching things now. Yeah. He has a cool attitude and cool look and right and neat art. It's just like okay they're starting to explore some of these relationships yeah. here and i like yeah. that that is why uh this volume here stuck with me the most mm. so far it's starting to get those things that make it stick so. you've also got a nice echo to this with this human agent they are who they are liaising with who it turns out is like the granddaughter of one of these Nazi scientists, I think. Mm -hmm. And there's this like gas you get exposed to that like mutates you to like prepare for like the coming of the conqueror worm. Like we are starting to wipe out humanity and then the conqueror worm is going to come and like completely destroy everything. But like her grandfather has sort of picked her out to be like, the the mother of the second coming of the second generation like she can survive she can like continue she can start humanity anew after the cleansing of the conqueror worm i'm forgetting the details it's been like it's a week or so since i read this <laughs> the the like right before the worm comes out it like breathes this gas out in, yes. into the atmosphere and anyone who's not wearing a gas mask gets changed into these like right. alien beings right. which we yeah. technically she was seen putting the gas in mask. a few other uh like er earlier v volumes we've just seen a c c couple of them there um mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, she has this gas mask on, which uh, the reveal is that the gas mask still doesn't really protect you. It, it, it still mm -hmm. permeates the the, the yeah. mask, but not as much. It's not as mm. much of a concentration. So it's yes. kind of like the smart Hulk thing where it's like you she, are still yeah, she, physically <laughs> changed, uh, yeah. which you didn't realize, but it's still you like you have your personality and can still talk mm, and mm. think and do all that stuff. And so that's why like that's how you are the like the bridge between mm. these these the like old earth and the new new earth here. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And she doesn't want any of this. She had no idea this was happening. She's like, don't 
make me the like the bridge between a newer, better humanity. I never asked for this. This isn't what I want. And she just she's an interesting presence in that story. And that she sort of sulks around for a while, just sort of following her grandpa around with this gas mask. Like, I hate this. I don't want this. I don't care about the conqueror worm. And I at the end of the story, she like takes the gas mask off and just like lets herself completely succumb to the gas and die. She's like, I am not continuing any plan you made for me. I refuse, which is yeah. the story Hellboy keeps running into that. There are these larger, more ancient forces who have designed him to be the catalyst of this destruction. And he's like, I want no part of this. <laughs> Don't right. put this on me. Yeah, it's 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 a good parallel. Um but also it, like it it is it, it's 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 strange because at like part of me wants to be like this is tragic for her right mm -hmm. but also she's a nazi and she's not interested in the conqueror worm because she's still interested in the dream of the third <laughs> reich and then, so it's just like well at the end of the, 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 the day you already were a monster right like mm -hmm. uh, yeah so uh, I, I I don't really feel bad for you for <laughs> I, <laughs> getting all of that, but it's 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 understandable, right? Mm. Um, well, like you said, it is that that like interesting mirror to Hellboy here, who's just like, I don't want nothing to do with this. Please stop. Mm -hmm. And there's layers of monstrosity. Like even a villain right. can have somebody who is pulling the strings behind <laughs> them. And wants them to do something. And they're like, no, like, that's not me. I'm not doing that. I'm doing right. another form of destruction, but I'm not doing one that bad. Yeah. Um, I, I, to kind of change this subject a little bit. What did you think of uh, what's his name? The little head in a jar here. I, I, I don't I, think I we've can't. gotten a good head in a jar in a long time on that show. If we, we watch some Futurama. Uh, okay, yeah, earlier yeah. this year to tie in with the new episodes on Hulu. Futurama, big head in a jar. <laughs> Piece of property. I was surprised that it took us like this far into Hellboy to get a head in a jar. And I love that Hellboy just stares at it and he's like, how often do you change that water? How does this work? Do you have a cleaning system? Do you, what, 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 I, what, what happens? <laughs> head in a jar is real classic. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, let's see. Let's see. Anything else about Conqueror Worm? I'm kind of looking through these final pages here. Um, I don't think there's really anything else that I wanted to mention about this. Yeah, let's let's move on to uh, this. This <coughs> third. Why well, I guess the like last little bit here is yeah that like in the midst of all this craziness in the midst of every like, what what seems like a good year and some change now of everyone being like you will usher in a new like all of that stuff he's just like i'm tired of that i don't want yeah, anything to do I quit. with this i i, I quit <laughs> i'm done <laughs> enough of this right i don't um, i don't like that like the vprd was my safe haven and i don't like that they're like yeah, kill Roger if you have to. We don't care about Roger. And he's like, I like Roger. Roger's a good guy. Like, he's just tired of being a pawn. He's tired of being there to execute other people's plans that he might not agree with. So he says yeah. goodbye to, to, to Kate Corrigan. Like, I'm taking off. I'm taking some me time. I'm traveling for a while. I was in Africa once. Africa was nice. I think I'm going to go back. And just like, I'm, I'm just I'm just going to go right off into the sunset and see what's out there, mm -hmm. um, which I, earlier you you asked, like, yeah, how much does the general public know about the BPRD and how often do they get to see hell boy or know about him? Um, and so this idea of him just quitting and then just fucking off to do who, who knows yeah, where will who, you go where yeah like the, the, like <laughs> they, they have this like almost romantic understanding of like but where will you go hell hell hellboy <laughs> like, to africa and and and, and <laughs> there is no there is no like bprd some like exec just being like well shit this is gonna be a lot of paperwork fuck right. uh how do we explain this uh <laughs> yeah he doesn't he doesn't tell anybody he doesn't put in a formal resignation he tells kate corrigan i'm out of here 
Uh, so you probably to like Liz and Abe for me. Right. I'll probably see you and around. Finger g- 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 <laughs> guns and then <laughs> walks off. Yeah, mm. <laughs> just walks off. He doesn't have a car. I'd love to no. see him drive yeah. a car. What, I want to see a Hellboy kind of mobile. Would, would he own? Oh, like a a Bronco or a Jeep, like a big boxy thing, like he is. Okay, yeah, yeah. He's I the one s- man a Hummer is Jeep. built for. He's the one man who deserves to drive a big monstrosity like a Hummer. The car is put there so Hellboy can drive it. I could also see see just like kind of those like old yet just like just just so old reliable pickup. Oh yeah, that's been. Like it was new in the like early 90s and it's like now 2020 and it still just works great. Right. Right. (laughs) I want to see his vacation where I want to see him put on a Panama hat with like two holes punched out for his horns. Right. He's wearing linen. (laughs) He's wearing sandals. Good stuff. Okay, so volume six, Strange Places. Um, we get two stories in this one. Each is kind of two ish- issues, uh, but the volume we read kind of just smashed them all together here. Um, and uh, like I said, the Hellboy in Africa story is my favorite because it at least it really crystallized for me how much every other force in the universe knows about Hellboy and how little he knows. Right. Uh, he's, he's not an oblivious guy. He knows what he needs to do to get his job done. He's very competent and very capable at his job, but he doesn't know like machinations and prophecies and, and things in other realms like that. Uh, and so yeah. it's not that he knows the full details of what it is he's supposed to do and then he denies it he's like i don't want there to be any plan for me i don't tell me about it i don't care what it is don't involve me like he really doesn't know there's so many forces out there in the shadows whispering about hellboy and he's like and he has no clue he might have an idea that somebody is whispering about him somewhere but he doesn't know what it is he doesn't know who all is involved like he's so out there in the dark about it and all of these animals, like all these animal spirits are like hissing at him and whispering about him like Hellboy, Hellboy, Hellboy. And it's so f- <laughs> I love the, like the bubble design on these that the words are like slightly off center in the word bubbles like there's supposed to be punctuation or something, but there isn't. It isn't yeah. Hellboy exclamation mark. It isn't Hellboy ellipses. It's just a singular standalone word. Hellboy. Like all these animal spirits, like just hiss and gripe at him about it. I think that's such a wonderfully eerie thing to happen. That no matter where he goes, demon, human, animal, alien, anything. Everybody knows who Hellboy is. They know he means something. They always know more than he does. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm I'm kind of wondering if the like off-center text is on purpose or not. Um cuz it like I I could understand if it's not, but also real if he, subtle touch if it is. Right. Or just like it feels, it's actually kind it of feels genius. Pr- Yes, it feels purposeful and subtle to me because it's used in that context. It's not like, oh, like this whole page was out of alignment or something. It's like all these spirits just saying his name with this sort of awkward hanging tension of this looks like there's space for like a period or an ellipses there. Where is it? It just stopped. It feels it like starts, a Dutch angle, with but for text. Yes. Right. It's just slightly <laughs> off. Like just That's so, called just italics. <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting thing to to note mm. there. I did not think about that as I was reading the, through he, it. But, he, but yeah, I mean, we also you you just said that you were. I I don't exactly know. Like, is this play t- t- taking place in like two thousand five or two thousand twenty? Yeah, I, think, I guess not, since it was written back right. in the it's, late nineties. We've 90s, seen but. Hellboy throughout the twentieth century. Like it could be set when Mignola was writing this in the 90s, but I'm not exactly sure. 
it's it sort of out of time 80s, early 90s yeah at the most recent um yeah but, but yeah it is out of time like you say but that's like i, I think what i was g- 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 getting at with that is he's been doing this job his whole life mm-hmm. basically so right. that's why, and he did also partly why he's so well known in the like spirit and supernatural yeah world. He's, he's a lifer he's a company man and then right. here, here and we go issue one he no aged, longer a company he, man <laughs> He's adopted into the BPRD, literally. He ages so fast. By the time he's like three, he is working. He's like on cases for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of wild. Um, but yeah, this first this first story is uh, we, we, we get the in, insight in the notes that Mignola wrote that this was kind of an idea for a story for Namor when he was working for Ma 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 Marvel, um, and it is this like twisted uh, uh, Little Mermaid Hans Christian Andersen inspired story. This like darker take on the Little Mermaid here. I when I was a kid, I still have it. Uh, I have a book called Mermaid Tales from Around the World, I think collected Mm -hmm. by Mary Pope Osborne. I could grab it and hold it up for you if you want. But it's a book of mermaid folk tales from all around the world. There is one from, I think, Nigeria. There's ones from like Germany and France and China and Japan and all over the place. These short stories, uh, including, I think, the Hans Christian Andersen Little Mermaid. But almost all of them are very dark and very sad. Yeah. It's tales of like lost loves, like a mer, a mer person. I think the one from Africa is like a it's called like the fish husband. Uh, I forget exactly where it is. I, I want to say it's Nigeria. I can grab it. But it's like it's a, a mer person falls in love with somebody on the land and then they can't be together. Or there's a story from somewhere in Europe where this mermaid like takes human form secretly and and falls in love with this man and they get married and they have children but there's something wrong with each of the children like it's kind of small at first like oh this you know my son's got one eye higher up on his head than the other one or he's got two different colored eyes this son has tusks now this son like it just keeps like devolving and the husband's like what's happening what's wrong with my children and one day he finds his wife taking a bath she would take these like I've locked the doors. I will pamper myself. This is my private time for me to take a bath. And he spies on her once and he sees like her fish tail. Like she's able to sort of drop the spell and be herself and be a mermaid and take this bath and swim around. And he's like, yeah. well, that's why I have weird sons. My wife's a mermaid. Like almost all of them had like loss. A wish gone wrong, destruction, weird kids, heartbreak. Not uh, practically none of them are happy tales. Yeah. There's like, something I, specifically sad about a mermaid. Oh, maybe more than any other mythological creature. A mermaid I, almost never means anything good. I I f- I feel like it is partly this idea of just the the kind of scary depths of the ocean and how much we yes. haven't explored I, the unknown right it is i'm gonna grab like, this book keep talking sure. i'll be back in a sec yeah it's 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 like this this fear of losing a loved one to unknown and just not knowing their fate right uh or or having them changed so much that uh it um that, that, yeah they are just like a different creature a different being um something like that i I, i'm not sure if uh melissa if you can still hear me or not but i also wanted yeah i was able to hear you the fact that uh at one point superman fell in love with a mermaid i think i've mentioned this on was she also a reporter we've done no Uh, (laughs) i work for the undersea planet 
Lori Lamaris uh, is a mermaid in DC Comics and a romantic interest for Superman. Man. Uh, she is f- from Tritonus, a city in the undersea lost continent of Atlantis and first appeared in Superman 129. She was created by Bill Finger and Wayne Boring. Um, Let's see. She's one of the uh, several Superman characters with the LL initials. Lois Lane, Lex Luthor, Lana mm. Lang, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. So in in this story, she is in a wheelchair and that it like she has like a blanket covering her mm. legs. And uh, I see I, what does it say where they meet as a. Clark met Lori, who was attending as a student um, and hiding her mermaid identity by posing as a wheelchair using student with a blanket covering her lower body. Yeah, they fall in love. He's like takes her on a date or two and then like he's about to like propose marriage and then she's just like well <sighs> there's some things you should know about me i'm a mermaid peace <laughs> so, uh yeah that that happened <laughs> i wanted to grab the book i was talking about it is oh, cool. mermaid tales from around the world retold by mary pope osborne illustrated by troy howell every story has a beautiful illustration like in the style of the culture and time period that it came from but even here on the cover, you can see it's this mermaid who's got this long, long hair and this long, long tail. The tail's got to be like 18 feet long and it yeah. just curls and curls around. And when I was a kid, like I loved this book, but also it kind of scared me because it's just so extreme. I'm like, that tail is too long. It's too curly. Like there is something like when you look at a weird deep deep undersea creature about it right yeah like this book like so perfectly captured the beauty and the terror of what a mermaid could be and that's i loved this hellboy in africa story for bringing me some of the eeriness of the mermaid and there's this yeah. like grandmother mermaid uh who has these like three granddaughters whether they're, they're literal blood relations or it's more of a a respect sort of thing. Like we are all part of the same community. I am effectively a grandmother. I I don't know if it's literal or not, but each of them come to her with a wish. And the first one wishes for, um, uh, oh, she see, makes I, some I, really she, dumb wish. She that, says like, I would have my lover return to me. He's a great hunter, but his pursuit right, of yes, one yes. certain beast has kept him apart for too, too long. Right. So the the grandmother mermaid was like, yes, I will reunite you with your lover that you haven't seen in ages. That beast did kill him. So I can only bring you his corpse. So then this like ghastly like zombie skeleton floats in and then she embraces him because it is the lover she's wished for for so long. And they kiss and then like she turns into like a, a corpse, too. It, and it then looks the second like he sis- bites her neck. I mean, it, it like it can right. look like he's kissing her n- neck and stuff like that. But I took that as a bite because, yeah, it immediately switches to like, and you will join him in yeah, death he- forever. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then the second daughter is like, OK, I thought that might happen. I was smarter with my wish. There is a man who I love. He is a human man. He lives on shore. I want to mm-hmm. be with him. Now, I know the game you're going to play with these wishes. You're going to like immediately transport me on shore. No, I have to be in human form first before I get up there, because otherwise I'm just going to to suffocate. And the grandma is like, all right, and snaps her fingers and then turns her into a human there deep, deep, deep below the sea. And then she dies. Yeah. Like you thought one step ahead, but you didn't think two steps ahead. And then the third daughter says that uh, our father died. He had this like spear marking his grave. The spear has been stolen. All I want is to get it back and grant it to uh, return it to its rightful place as the sign of respect and memory of my father. So then the the grandmother, the mermaid gives her this. She returns it to the grave and then the father's spirit appears and is like, I'm really disappointed in you. You thought that was worth it. Like they got all these wishes because they kidnapped Hellboy and brought him to this undersea like mermaid grandmother witch and he's like 
That man did nothing to you. He's innocent. Why did you think it was worth trading his safety to get this dumb memorial to put back on my grave? So then the, so she thought through her wish. There was no immediate like twist to her. Mm-hmm. But she she was also looking at Hellboy as just collateral, just a tool, just a means to an end. And this go I love the idea of a ghost appearing like, no, don't do that. Why would you pay that much? Like, I do not want you to pay respect to me in that way. You made too big of a sacrifice. I want you to undo it. And so then she's like, I have to go save Hellboy now. I, yeah. my dad's right. I did. I did the wrong thing. I, I thought that was, I like the interaction of the mermaid story and something more like a genie story. The classic mm. tale of a wish gone wrong. I like that. You've got immediately a very classic wish gone wrong. Then you have a character who's like, I think I've outsmarted you. No, you haven't outsmarted me. You didn't think that far ahead. And then a character who does think out what she wants. She wants something that is very small and humble. It's not for herself. It is in respect and memory of her father. She gets the wish. Everything goes off without a hitch. That is like a perfect transaction between her and this wish granting entity. And then she delivers the boon back to the grave. And then the spirit's like, no, no, take it back. This was bad. <laughs> Go save that monster that loves pancakes. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've all heard the story. The famous pancake <laughs> loving Hellboy. Everyone knows. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting one because Hellboy is just captive here this whole time, right? Like he's not like actively fighting anything or or stuff, at, at, at least yet, right? Um, and he's just kind of sitting there, like watching this whole thing unfold. Um, and then he's he finally uh, is broken furry. But this is also kind of while he is quite literally a captive audience, um, like we start to get a little bit more about his right hand and uh, the fact that like, hey, like there's. There's more than one evil force out there who's after your right hand. And he's yeah. just like, I don't I don't freaking care. Just take it like I just get it over with all this stuff. And then no, oh, I, I, could, could I just I, want to show you. Ahead. I found I found the I found the Nigerian story. It is from Nigeria in this mermaid. Book. That's cool. It's called The Fish Husband. So look, there he is. There's a merman trying to talk to a lady in a really cool dress. He looks like a little slug, a little slug man. (laughs) Well, here's the story about like the all the weird kids. So you see, like there's the the son with one eye higher on his head than the other, and then the other son is like, oh, he's covered in hair. That was his deal. And like there's Mm. the husband freaking out because he found his fish wife. This we we've accidentally stumbled upon one of the core haunting texts of my childhood this book of mermaid tales like you've seen little mermaid you're like oh cute she's got like a fish she's friends with and then i read this book i'm like this is deeply unnerving but also in a way that i'm fascinated with it and i'm never letting go of it and i'm 33 and i still know exactly where to go to get this weird spooky (laughs) mermaid book to tell you about um yeah 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 so let's see we got hellboy breaking free um he kind of learns more people are after his his hands but like that's the thing they could still use the hand for uh like without his body um so he's like screw that starts he ends up killing uh the i don't remember what uh her name was in full and not seeing it just by a quick look through all of this stuff but that like grandmother mermaid figure yes. ends up killing her chopping her up into a bunch of pieces uh and then f- finding her like big treasure room which is j- just all of these l- l- little like sarcophaguses of sailors souls it's real creepy mm-hmm. they almost look like it eggs. is like it, it, it almost I, looks like in a- aliens when like they d- d- discover a room just full of eggs, right? Mm-hmm. And it's just like, oh shit, this is bad. But like in in this, it's just like it's creepy, it's dis- it's d- 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 disgusting. Um, but then it, it's once they, what how do they do? It's once they like truly kill her, uh, that all of the 
souls get released and it's the like these so these souls come out manifested as these like golden birds and it, it was just a yeah. beautiful panel um of 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 all of these like birds underwater flying to the surface and just like going off into this thing it just felt magical in another interesting way that we haven't mm -hmm. really seen here like it's it was not a like magical evil that like is like impending doom but it was also not like man the power of pancakes it was it, it was just like it's golden shiny magic there's like, many there's just light he oh. here right <clears throat> Speaking of golden magic, at one point in either like the right hand of doom or conquer worm, one of the earlier, like more mythology, you know, like the actual lore of Hellboy, one of the earlier stories in this collection we read, they get his crown to appear over his head, his infernal crown. Mm -hmm. And I love how that thing is drawn and that it is just a simple line drawing of like a crown with three points on it. It looks like it, something it, you would draw when you were a kid. Yeah, it, and it just looks like, like a 2D like crown, exactly. But you know it exists yes, in like the three-dimensional space and is actually right. round. Yeah. I it's the way that thing is drawn where it means something so absolutely terrible. But it's just like the simplest little like skinny line drawing with no shading, not a single dimension on it. It is so absolutely Microsoft Paint flat. I love that's so effective. Like the more simple it is, the more terrifying it is. I great yeah. choice on that crown. There's 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 a power in its simplicity. Right. Yeah. It's just a crown. It It, it is like the most base. Like when you think of a crown. That's yes. it. Like that's the one. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, some some interesting stuff with that. Uh. What I will say about this last kind of short story this last two page thing uh the first handful of pages Hellboy uh escapes all of the mermaid mm -hmm. stuff happening and washes up on this island um and is a just immediately finds some drinking buddies um and i i i thought it was uh Go right, like he's sitting there telling his 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 st his story. He's like, so there I am, flopping around, j j j j drowning. And what do they do? They pounded a goddamn nail into my head right here, and they're just no, no, no way. Like they are eating his story up. It's great. He's like, yeah. Then there was this giant ta ta talking fish who wanted to eat me and feed me to a whale and chop me up in little, little pieces and send me to all of her friends. And then he's just like, that's a raw treatment for a Christian or any so sort of man, which I thought that line was hilarious because at this <laughs> point, I don't know that these guys don't exist and that they're just skeletons right mm. and so i i think he's like at this inn like he's chatting it up with these guys and he's like man that's a terrible thing for a christian to go to haru and i'm sitting there like do you do you see who you're talking to like do, 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 do you think he's a christian man a fine young christian man right <laughs> <laughs> this guy looks like a devil <laughs> I just thought it was it was great. I was just like amazing. Funny. You have had too I many did. of those beers. <laughs> I really liked that this fake out with the sailor skeletons because you just see the establishing shot of like looking through like a window, an old wooden window that might be on like the bow of a ship or something. And then Hellboy's in there just commiserating with these sailors and they've kind of an old fashioned way of talking. You're not quite sure where are we and how did he get here? But this is a world where like anything seems possible. And Elboy's lived such a long life where he's met so many people like maybe he's friends with these old sailors that just sort of keep the old ways, just sort of speak to more traditional ways, yeah, even though it's like probably like 1992. Maybe they do still sing sea shanties <laughs> like I don't know. Oh, and yeah. so when he turns around and they're just like cobweb skeletons it's so eerie it makes absolute it's, sense but like is, in a story so strange you never thought to like question it before this is 
a perfect example of the like ideal page turn in a comic here because yeah like they're they're telling stories they hear some noise outside they're all like what what, what is that how boy gets up to go look uh, and you get a, a, a panel from inside the room. You see the silhouettes of the two guys. You see how looking out the window. The very next panel has switched. So you're outside the building looking at the window and how boy on the inside. And then this last panel, he's he's like, I think you guys can relax. And then he looks back. Guys. And right, there's no, no answer. And then you turn the page and it's just this big panel of hell boy looking back at the, just these these dusty skeletons here. And it's just like, oh, this is so cool. It's it's just this like page flip that worked so good. Um, so, yeah. And then he uh, ends up being told the like origin of the universe and these like angel he steps into this like glowing uh, this like glowing sea of gold which we learn is kind of like the, the 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 blood of this one dude who was killed in this ca ca castle right down the road there's some weird stuff happening in this last yeah. story i gotta be honest i don't know if i understand exactly what happened mm -hmm. in this last bit here it is more sort of metaphorical it's and more about the vibe of yes yes more about the vibe of no matter how hard he tries to get away hellboy is always going to be drawn back into these forces that have plans for him it, be it like the witch goddess hecate or or anybody else she is conniving with there is a massive ancient magical power that's like got its tendrils around him in a way like he can't even really see yeah um, I happen to read there's a paragraph in here and I didn't want to read too, too much because I didn't want to spoil stuff. Um, but there is a paragraph in here on how boys Wikipedia page uh, that kind of sums up his right hand of dome here. And it has as revealed in strange places how boys right hand was originally the right hand of Anum, uh, one of the watcher angels that watched over the burgeoning earth and created the uh, the Ogdru Jihad. Uh, after seeing the Ogdru Jihad, I, oh, after sealing the Ogdru Jihad away, Anum was destroyed by his fellow spirits. Only his right hand remained intact uh, and it was kept and preserved by the Hyperboreans, the first race of man. Uh, the right hand of doom eventually ended up uh, the possession of blah, 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 blah. Uh, I don't think we've gotten to that ex 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just like even reading these like two or three sentence update was like, oh, OK, I think I understand it now. <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. there's a lot to unpack in in this yeah. and a lot of lore and mythology of an in ilk that I'm not familiar with, right? Like th this yeah. tr truly felt like a bit that was uh like original to Hellboy. It's not like okay, this yes. is based on a Hans Christian Andersen tale. Mm. This is based off some other mythology. It it, it was like Okay, Mignol is really digging in into yeah. like the spaces of his mind here. And it could be that it is a reference to something I'm just not familiar with. But this, to me, felt mm. like, okay, he's not like riffing on some other mm -hmm. story here, right? Um, so yeah, it's fascinating stuff. But it, 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 to me, feels like a story that begs the like i'm gonna have to go back and read this like i'm gonna have to go back and keep this volume in mind and this story specifically in mind and maybe reread that once every so often as i learn new mm -hmm. things down the road right um so it's like book bookmark this this one here it feels important in a, in a mm -hmm. really, really really good way here but yeah i it was just a lot and i was just kind of lost 
in this all here of I, angels what what or do job what I, the fuck is happening it's 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 a lot i think another like something i struggle with is like i read these right before bed a classic reading time sure. for an yeah. adult <laughs> and then i will read something like oh that's really interesting and then i'll go to sleep and then immediately wake up and go to work and the next day i'm like what what was i reading what happened to old boy what was he doing yeah um so i i i don't know if i have much to say on this last story mm. it, it in terms of the lore at at least but like we said, yeah, it feels dreamlike. It it feels otherworldly in a way that, like, I was also questioning, like, is this real? Like, is he dreaming this? Is this a hallucination? Mm. What is happening here? Uh, I think it is real. But something else that I also wanted to point out is there's a footnote um, in mm. here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, it's earlier on in this last story, I think when he's talking with no, uh, it's, it's after we realize that the drinking buddies are skeletons and he goes out to talk with, uh, this like iron maiden Hecate, um, mm -hmm. which goddess, whoever it is. Um, and they're, 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 they're talking, um, and she, she's like damn dude like you got captured and i have plans but i wasn't gonna be able to reach you in that you're lucky to like be out of, of yeah th and this year right he was underwater for like two years there was some that's, like magical the, time dilation nonsense yes and yeah, right, and it is displayed with years. just a it's a foot and it's just a right like there's nothing it's not like he he finds that like Kate Corgan's been looking for him because like the BPRPD hasn't had heard from him in two years. It's not like he comes out and the world is different. There's nothing textual that, that tells him that he's been gone for two years. It's literally a footnote where Hecate's like, you were gone for quite some time. And it's like, Mike says two years. <laughs> like, whoa. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. What does Good that memory, mean? Mike. Thanks. Yeah, it, like it. It is this this strange thing because this whole sequence is so fluid. Uh, no pun intended with all this yes. wa wa water. It no is good this word like for it. you 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 get like rescued from this this like these mermaid this whole mermaid situation, which you're just sitting there watching it play out. Right, you see these three. Uh, these three mer mer mermaids ask for the wish and watch it all unfold. You get rescued, you kill the 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 mm. grandma, release all those souls, and then you just kind of float upwards and you wash up on on the beach here, right? And it's just this, huh? Um, in in interesting stuff. Uh, that yeah, it's just it seems fluid. So that's yeah. that's kind of all I have to say. It was. Ba baffling that's just two years holy moly right wild yeah yeah we are getting into sort of a a, a time slippy part of the magic which is one of yeah. the most haunting things about magic is how it can dilute time and space uh absolutely you know you, you have this the, the rip fan winkle thing like small things that end up taking like massive amounts of of time or no time at all are both extremely eerie and yeah. that's another one of those deep childhood things where you read it in a storybook or like the pensive children go into the wardrobe and they live in Narnia for what feels like years and they come out of the wardrobe and it was and only an hour. Week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, so it's so unnerving. I'm excited for I think this is an interesting place for this volume to leave off. We're going to be in for yeah. intriguing stuff when we come back next Absolutely. month. Absolutely. Uh, I know we are on a bit of a time crunch, so I'm going to move things right along. Uh, I'm going to bring Bingo up on <laughs> screen here. All right. Um, I, 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 do we want to do the arted to da 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 in no. this one? No, because we do get a bunch of like expository kind of uh, like art on on. No, no, no. The walls. And no, stuff like no, no. OK. No, arted to death is something like oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Continue. Arted to death is like a you suffer for your art to the point where you it's a black swan. It's a Suspiria. It's one of those. You're right. You're right. You're right. OK, so I don't think we got an update to bingo then. That was the only one that I was kind of thinking of. But yeah, just realized what that was at the last minute there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not just yeah. a death displayed via art. <laughs> it is you dance so hard you you died right um yeah so uh with that being said we typically at this time would do recommendations and stuff but for our end of the month specials uh we like to do that at the first and the last time we cover uh, something so no recommendations this time um except except for this book maybe this book yeah mermaid tales from around the world Retold by Mary Pope Osborne, written sometime in the 90s by Scholastic. Uh, check a local used bookstore. I don't know if this thing is still or in print, but this is magnificent. Yeah. Great for a, ch- a child with a strong spine who's up for being like kind of weirded out and unnerved. Yes. Yeah. And great for an yeah. adult. Great for a folklore lover. Put this on your shelf next to Hellboy. Interesting book. Um, cool. Well, that being said, we already have what we will be discussing this next week. We have it all picked out and ready to go uh, this next month, October, spooky month, all month, all spooky, all month. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so for the first week in October, uh, Melissa, you had requested some Archie horror Uh, So that Mm. is exactly what we are going to do. I pitched you a number of Archie horror comics and you went with Afterlife with Archie. Uh, We had previously discussed uh, Sabrina the Teenage Mm. Witch here on the show years ago. uh, And it's always been one of our favorites. Uh, So we're getting back to some Archie horror. Uh, We are writing the entirety of the Afterlife with Archie series, which is a total of 10 issues. Um, There is a collected volume one. However, there is not a collected volume two. So those last handful of of issues, you just kind of have to read uh, as single issues. But those are all available on Comixology Unlimited if you are a subscriber to that service. Uh, so yeah, go go check it out. We'll start Spooky Month with some with some familiar characters, but with a twist. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it'll be good and it will be fun. <clears throat> um, I'm excited for Spooky Month and to see what we get into. I'm scared because <laughs> I, I like <laughs> Spooky Month is I always a thing. Be. Like I like I I I don't like scary things. I could do scary comics. I can do this, but but like scary movies or scary sh- sh- shows, I'm always just like, I don't know. So w- one of these things will give me nightmares eventually. Uh, and I'll I, have if, to if it doesn't, back. we're doing our jobs wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah. Our afterlife with Archie issues one through ten. Go check it out. That's what mm-hmm. we will be t- talking about this next week. Uh, and then at the end of October, we'll be back for some more hell bo- 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 yes. bo- 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 uh, to do the next three volumes, seven, eight and nine. Uh, so, yeah, be on the lookout for all of that. Good stuff. Melissa, any other kind of final words, thoughts you want to put I down here? No, I no? Have, I have to leave. I- OK, <laughs> I, I, I have to go meet my brother and my sister in law to take my niece to Disney on ice. <laughs> there you go. Uh, where can the pe- people find you on the interwebs then? Uh, I have been at Wilkie Wit on platforms, having been known as Twitter and Instagram. Find me. Th- I, I don't post much, but you can send me a DM if you also have read this mermaid book. Please tell me. There you go. Uh, and if you guys want to find me, I am at Yo Kyle Springer on most of the social media places. Uh, and if you'd like to stay up to date with all of the stuff that we do here at the Whatnots, we are at the Whatnots on most of the social media places uh, or at the Whatnots official. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, we got plenty more videos for you all to check out right here. Go check them out right there. Go like, share, subscribe. This has been number 272 of the Whatnots Review Show. We will see you all next time. Bye. Bye.